I'm still, my, my heart's pretty softened right now because the presence of God is thick in here today, and that worship was incredible. So all of you that came out and put in this week, I just want to tell y'all thanks. Everybody give them a hand. Hey, um, I just want to say real quick, because everybody pretty much that's here today was here last week, and let me tell you what, last week was awesome, because I don't know of many churches that are going to cancel the service and going to serve, and everybody show up. But y'all showed up, so let me just give y'all a hand. Man, that was incredible. And I think it's important that y'all know that the people that own this place, they came in the next day and they looked around and they were like... This place looks crazy. What? It's clean. What's going on around here? So they were wondering who did this. And finally, one of them was like, hey, it was the church. And so they contacted Jason, who's over the wrestling academy. And uh, Jason said, yeah, it was them. And they told me to tell everybody thank you so much. And they were actually talking about it that whole day. Um, so once again, give y'all self a hand. Y'all did a great job. I'm so thankful to be leading a church that has a heart for service. It doesn't want to just sit here on Sunday saying this is our thing, but wants to make a difference in the world around us. And with that, I want to tell you that I did meet with Philip Fletcher, and I met, I talked with him. And we are going to be investing in the community of Brookside. It's going to start out, we're just going to go in probably and help clean up. Maybe, maybe volunteer some time for King's class where the children will learn more about Christ. Um, we might help with the Christmas store. But we're going to invest in that community, and I'm so excited that we had this opportunity so that we can really start being the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen. Here in Conway, here in our city, we can make a difference right here in our city. And we're going to start with the community of Brookside. That's right. That, that is so incredible. We've been talking about this. We did a series about a dangerous church. We talked about being the type of church that isn't just here on Sundays, that is being the church every day. And through our praying, through trying to say, what does that look like? God has opened the door for us to start being the church. And I'm just so thankful. Before we get started today, let's, let's go to the Lord a word of prayer. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we are thankful for this day. We are thankful, first and foremost, for your son, Jesus. That's why we're here today, to celebrate his victory over death to celebrate the fact that He is risen, to celebrate that our sins are forgiven in Him, that His blood covers us and we can come before You. Father, I thank You for this day. I thank You for these people here. Father, I thank You for the worship this morning. Thank You that You are here, Father. Father, I pray that You will fill me today with Your presence, with Your words, to proclaim the word that You have given. Lord, may their hearts be softened. And today, of all days, may their eyes be open because that's what we're talking about today is opening our eyes. So, Lord, I pray that if their eyes are not already open, that today will be a day that they will open their eyes and see your presence in their life right now, today. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to start right now with Luke chapter 24, verse 5. It says, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. See, this right here is the day of the resurrection. After Jesus is crucified, this is the day of the resurrection. They go to the tomb and they look for him and his body's not there. They're looking for him and he's not there. And then they see these probably water angels. They have to be angels. And they're like, what is this? And they're scared. They're frightened. And Jesus isn't there, and he should be there, and they don't know what's going on. And the angels say, why are you frightened? You're looking in the wrong place. You're not going to find the living God right here. This is not where he's at. You're really looking in the wrong place. You know, sometimes we look in the wrong place for things. Sometimes we see things different than what they are. Sometimes things take place, and we can't see what's really there. A good example is, Chris, you want to give me a quote? Who sees a woman's face right here? You see a woman's face, raise your hand. Now, what if you see where it says liar? If you see where it says liar, raise your hand. See, it can be either or. You might not be seeing the right thing. What about the other one? 
Who sees a bunny rabbit? Who sees a duck? Yeah. See, if you don't have eyes to see, you might not see that. You've got to have eyes to see. If you're focused so much on the rabbit, you might never see the duck. No saying you might miss the forest because of the trees. You have to have eyes to see. So, today we're going to talk about these two guys that after the resurrection are locked walking along the road. And God is going to be with them. God in the flesh is going to be with them. And they're not going to see. In verse 13 of Luke 24 it says, Now that same day, this is the day of the resurrection, the first Easter, two of them, two of them, this is believers in Christ, one of them may have been one of the original one of the original apostles. We don't know, it doesn't specify. But based upon the language of the text, it looks like probably one of them was an apostle. Because it talks about he the apostles, the ladies had went back to the apostles and went back and said, He's risen. And then the next thing you read is two of them. So it's almost like two of or one of the apostles, and then this other one. We know this other guy's name is Cleopas, and we'll read that in a minute. So two of them are walking down the road. They're going to a village called Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Jesus has just been crucified. So they're walking along and they're talking about this. They're talking about it a lot like we would current events. Uh, you remember back in like April, we were talking quite a bit about Bonnie Katrina. We, we were talking about it. It was a current event. It was fresh on our mind. And now as a result of that, we're talking a lot about how much the Razorbacks suck. But they got a win yesterday, so Woo! praise God for that, right? We set them small victories. Miracles do happen. Miracles do happen. They do. Other current events. You know, last week during the debates, Obama and Mitt Romney, I heard they about dueled it out. I mean, I thought they was going to go MMA style. That's a current event. It's something that we talk about. Last year, around this time, it's been about a year now, Osama bin Laden was killed. When the SEAL teams got him, we, we talked about that quite a bit. That was a long long, drawn-out process. It took forever before we finally got Osama bin Laden. It took a long time. And why were we looking for Osama bin Laden to begin with? 9-11. This conversation these people were having, these two guys, it's about like the conversations we were having at 9-11. You remember the fear? You remember the confusion of that time? And those, and those towers fell. I mean, for weeks, for weeks, man, there was a lot of fear. What's next? What's going to happen? Where do we go from here? How did, how did this all take place? Why did this all take place? That's exactly what these two guys are going through. That's exactly what they're going through. Because, see, what's going on with them, for many, many years, for many, many years, believers had been waiting on the appearance of Messiah. The one who would be the savior of the world. The anointed one. They're waiting on God to send the Messiah. And their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents, they would all talk about one day Messiah is coming. One day he is coming. So these guys, during their life, they had hoped for it. They had prayed about it. They had all these dreams about when Messiah comes, what that's going to look like. What is he going to look like? What is he going to do? Is he going to overthrow this Roman occupation that we're persecuted by every day? What's he going to look like? They had all these dreams that he would. They had all these thoughts and hopes. But then, they had this problem. Because three days before all this, Jesus is crucified. See, they thought, after all that praying, they thought that Jesus was the Messiah. He shows up, he arrives on the scene, and they're like, this has got to be him. No one had ever been around anything like Jesus before. They'd never seen anyone like him. He did miracles, and when he talked, it was otherworldly that he would say, people were like, that's got to be him. That's got to be Messiah. And they put all their hopes in him. They put all their trust in him. They put all their faith in him. And then their, their hope was crucified on the side of a hill called the skull. All their hopes. So they're shattered at this point. They're really shattered. This is pretty much the moment that they realize this isn't going exactly the way I planned. This isn't exactly going the way I planned. Some of us are like that today. We look at our lives and we say, this was not in the master plan. Maybe you went to college. 
He's going to get a degree. Then you got a girl pregnant. You're going to drop out of school now. You can't stay in school and support a family. That's not what you had planned. That's, that's not what you hoped for. Maybe, maybe you were dating somebody. Put all your eggs in that basket. You're thinking about marriage. Then you broke up. And now you're wondering, how do I put the pieces back together? All my eggs are now cracked. How do I put them back together? You can't put a Humpty Dumpty back together again. We're, we're talking about marriage. What about getting married and going through a divorce? Some of us have been through a divorce. And you look and you say, I'd said until death do his part. But somewhere along the way, the parting came before death. So now how am I going to get by as a single parent? Wasn't in the master plan. It's not exactly what you hoped for. Some of you, some of you, maybe you're in this season of your life where you're like, hey, I'm going to enjoy this phase of my life. And then you, you find out your mom or your dad has Alzheimer's. You've got to start taking care of your parent. You're like, I know I've got to take care of them. I know I have to do the right thing. But man, that's going to be expensive. I can't afford it. How am I going to do this? My whole savings is gone. But that's what i got to do. This isn't, what I, this isn't what I hoped for. I was ready to take some cruises. But i got to take care of mom. Some of us are in that situation, and that's where these guys were right here. That's where they're at. They're at that place where they're like, this isn't what I expected. Jesus has been crucified. This isn't what I expected. Their hope is gone. They're lost. So verse 15 says, as they talk and discuss these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Why not? Why, why could they not see him? Maybe, maybe God had something he needed to teach them first. Maybe God had something he needed to teach us first. Maybe, maybe God was just like, you can't handle the truth! Y'all remember that movie? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. You know, movie. We don't know exactly why, but they were kept from seeing him. So here it is. We have God in the flesh in front of him, and they can't see him. Jesus comes walking up as they're talking about Jesus. He comes walking up, and they don't even recognize him. They don't even recognize who he is. You ever had something in front of you that's just so close that you just overlook it? Like we've all heard that, so, that, say, that saying, if it's a snake, you've been bit. I can remember when we first moved into our house, you know, we got the house, and we was really, really excited. Big house, it's pretty nice, I've been there. We were so excited. I mean, God has blessed us. He really had. We couldn't afford that house, but there it was, and we could afford it. He, made away. So we move in and we're excited. And it's in October when it's actually like the last day of October when, when we sign the mortgage documents. We move in. And then the cold weather rolls in. And we, we knew we had this special system that's supposed to save us this money. It's got heating strips and it's got a heat pump so it, it will draw heat or it'll draw air from outside to the heat pump. But when it gets really cold, there's not enough warm air outside. These heating strips kick on. And that's, that's the air runs across those heating strips and that's what's going to heat the house. So we get there, and like the first night, it's like 32 degrees. It's like 48 degrees in the house. And it's running all night long. And our baby is blue and breathing frost. And we're like, dude, why is this thing not heating up? I mean, it was just working. It's blowing. I can, I can feel it, but it's, it's like cold. What's going on? We can't figure it out. We can't figure it out. It's going to be expensive. So I, I get in there. I, I call my little brother. He's an electrician. And he comes up, and we get in there. We tear it apart. We look, and we're looking in there. We can see it's got to be the heat strips. The heat strips aren't kicking on. But why not? He, he tests them and he puts the voltage meter to them and everything's fine. And I saw this one of the wire that wasn't connected. But I mean, we tested them. It, it, it should work. It, it's got a continuous loop. It should work. It, it's, it's got a circuit going. What is going on with this thing? And then our electric bill, because our heat was running all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, our electric bill was like $490. It was at that point in time, I was like, I think I want to sell this out. <laughs> I was like, man, what am I going to do? So finally, at, at, at Zinda's behest, she's like, hey, just call, call your home warranty. It's 75 bucks. So I did. That's what I did. I called the home warranty people. You know, paid the deductible. They come out, this guy comes, and he looks, and he says, oh, it's this little wire right here. He hooks it up, and he works just fine now. I had saw that wire. I saw it. It was right in front of my face. But I didn't know what it was. I didn't recognize it. It was right there. Think of the money I could have saved. 
Think of the Christmas presents that could have came in. We might have like a four hundred ninety dollar heat bill or electric bill. I mean, man, it was right in front of my face, but I missed it. How many of us have had things like that right in front of our face? And we missed it? You know, did you notice it as we was reading this verse that it said these guys were heading to Emmaus, which is seven miles from Jerusalem? They're heading away. They're supposed to stay and wait. Jerusalem. Jesus had told them when he was still alive that they were supposed to wait. And they're heading away from Jerusalem doing exactly what he told them. They're heading in the wrong direction. And let me tell you what, that is great news. You know what's great news? It's hope. Because they're headed in the wrong direction, and yet Jesus still shows up. Some of us are heading in the wrong direction, but Jesus can still show up. That's right. The question is going to be, will we recognize him? And that's what we're looking at today because this whole series is about <coughs> can we see him? And in order to see him in everything, see, this whole month we're going to be talking about can we see him in the minute things? Can we see him when we're stapling paper at work? Can we see him in the small things? And in order to see him in the small things, we have to be able to just see him. We have to be able to lay our eyes on him. We have to be able to see him, period. And that's what we're looking at today. And these guys, they couldn't see him. They couldn't see him. But finally, Jesus, he speaks up. He says, he asked him, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, like, like many of us are downcast. You know, like many of us are lonely, angry, hurt, in a place of despair. We realize things aren't going exactly the way I planned. We're a little, we're a little downcast. But Jesus shows up when they're downcast. The life-changing truth is right in front of them. It's right there while they're hurt. They just got to have eyes to see it. You got to have eyes to see it. So one of them named Cleopas, he asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? Do you not know the things that have happened here? I mean, he's like saying, What planet are you from? This is what everybody's talking about. Just like when them towers fell. This is what everybody's talking about. Did you just get to Jerusalem? Are you mad? I mean, what's... Do you not understand that Jesus was crucified? Have you been living in a cave? And at that point, Jesus was probably, probably thinking, well, I mean, technically for the past three days, yeah, I've been living in a cave. But that's, that's not what he said. You know, I can actually imagine Jesus right here. Like, just imagine what he's thinking. It, it's not that hard to imagine what he's thinking. When they're like, do you not know what happened? He's like, do I not know what's going on? Do I, do I not know what happened? I think that Y'all don't know what happened because you see, God gave me a mission. And it was hard. It was hard. But I stayed the course. I faced the devil face to face, was tempted face to face by the devil. And I resisted him because I'm obedient to God and I love him. I did all of these things. Yeah, sure. I slipped up just a little bit in the garden of Gethsemane. I, I slipped up. I got a little scared. But it's only because I could see the pain that was to come. And I knew that pain would hurt, man. I knew it would hurt bad. So for a moment, I wavered. But I talked to my father. And he said, stay the course. See it through. So I prayed and I said, be it your will, not my will. I'll stay the course. Then, then they came and they arrested me. They falsely accused me. And I stopped it. My guys were ready to fight but I had to be obedient. I love you. I love you. And they beat me. And they beat me. And they beat me. They beat me until I was more like hamburger than human. But I stayed the course. Then they whipped me. And every time they whipped me, every time they whipped me, there was joy in me because I know that the, my word says by these stripes you will be healed. So every lash I knew was healing for you. Stay the course. They put nails in my wrist and in my feet, and it hurt. But I saw it through. Then they lifted me up on a cross. It was hard to breathe. It was hard to breathe. I was suffocating. The devil whispered in my ear, just strike him down. Knowing that with a word, called out legions of angels. But I didn't. Because I love him. I had to 
stay the course. And at the right time, when the moment was right, I said to my father, in your hand I commit my spirit. I said it is finished. And I gave up my spirit. And I died. And the whole world shook. But that's not where it's over. Because see, at that moment, that's when the veil was torn. While you were hurting and you were praying and you were crying and you were devastated, I went and I saw the devil and he no longer holds the keys to hell, to death, the grave. I have those keys right here in my pocket. Yeah, the devil, he may bark and he may bite or he may try to bite, but you ain't got to worry about his bite because I kicked his teeth in. Because here I am, I'm risen. I am risen. And you ask me, do I know, not know what happened? Oh, I know what happened. I know what happened. But Jesus, that's, that's not what he said. That's not what he said at all. I mean, I can see him thinking that. I mean, imagine, you went through all of this. You went through all of this, and someone's like, do you not know what happened? And you're like, do I not know what happened? So I'm thinking that maybe God does have a sense of humor. Because what Jesus says next is kind of funny. He says, what things? Can you imagine what things? <laughs> That's funny to me. What things? Do I know what? What things? They say about Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. He was powerful in word. When he spoke, when he spoke, it was like with authority. And it resonated with them people's souls. And it it's like they were feeding off of his word. It was like he was living bread. They just, he was so powerful in his word. They would hear it. They wanted to hear more. Give me more, teacher. Give me more, teacher. Give me more. Powerful indeed. I mean, when Jesus showed up, deaf people started hearing. Mute people started talking. Blind people started seeing. He turned water into wine. Some of y'all like that, huh? <laughs> he said, Come forth, and Lazarus came forth from his grave. He told the centurion, just go home. He's just sleeping, you go, just go home. He took care of all of these things with his word and in his deeds. This guy was powerful. Things change when Jesus shows up. So it says, the chief priests and all our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped, there it is, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. That's great. You have, you have these guys telling Jesus. They, you have these guys telling Jesus about Jesus. Isn't that some? These guys are sitting here telling Jesus about Jesus. And you know what? That's where some of us are at. It is. I've been there. Trying to tell Jesus about Jesus. Can't see Jesus because I got it all figured out. Camps have been like that. We can't see him because we already know the answers. We don't see that he's right there with us. He's right in front of us because we already know. You can tell me that Bible story. I know that Bible story. You ain't telling me nothing I don't know. But we don't see Jesus right in front of us. We got it all figured out. It says they had hoped. Obviously what they'd hoped for wasn't going to happen. They had hoped. It's not going to happen. I remember when I was a kid, my, my dad was not in the picture. My dad would call on Fridays. And he would say, yeah, I'm coming again. Saturday morning, man, I'll be ready. I had my little, my little suitcase ready. My brother, he'd already be gone. His dad already came and got him. And I, I'm sitting there, I'm waiting on my dad, man. I'm getting excited. My dad's coming this time. Dad's coming. About 3 o'clock, my mom would get the call. You know, well, I'm running a little late, but I, I'm going to be there, okay? All would come tell me, son, your daddy is running a little late, but he's going to be here. You know, inevitably about six or seven, I'm like, that ain't coming. And then he'd call and say, well, uh, he wouldn't tell me this, of course. He would say, well, um, just tell him I had to work. See, my dad was down at my friend's place, this little bar in North Little Rock. That's where he was at. So what I'm telling you is my dad wasn't really a great dad. I needed, I needed someone in my life. Fortunately, I had a godfather named Ed. 
and Ed had helped raise me since I was a kid, and I, I longed to be with Ed. Man, I wanted to see Ed all the time. He had to take me hunting and fishing. He took me to Disney World. I mean, him and his wife were good to me. They were good to me. Um, they, they took me and my brother to Biloxi, Mississippi one time, the whole way down. He's like, are there yet? Are there yet? Are there yet? Um, it was a great trip. Um, they were good to me, man, and I loved Ed. And see, I knew that death happened because when I was I was young, my great-grandfather died. So when I came to know Christ, like every night I would pray to Ed and live until I was going to be 18 years old. I wanted him to see me become a man. I would pray this thing constantly. I'd pray constantly. And I had all these, these hopes and these dreams, and Ed's going to be there, you know, and if I can't get to school, he'll help send me to school. And I mean, you know, I was a kid, and sometimes we're selfish, and we think things, and I'm like, Ed had money. He bought everything he had. had cash. He didn't pay car payments. I'm like, I want a truck. I want a motorcycle. I mean, I had all these hopes and all these dreams, you know. And then when, when I was 12, all hope was gone because I got the phone call that Ed had died. I prayed for him every night. Just like these two guys had prayed for Messiah constantly. They prayed for him. Jesus to come. Man, I love him. I just wanted him to be there, and I, I wanted to be with him. You know, I wanted to keep going hunting fish and driving his boat. You know, I love driving his boat. And he was gone. And I was hurt. I was devastated. I realized this, this isn't what I planned for. This isn't what I hoped for. And once again, some of you are right now at that place where what you hoped for, you realize it's not there. Maybe when you went to college, you didn't get anybody praying. Maybe you went to college, getting this degree, and you have all these hopes and aspirations of changing the world. You're in college, and you hear all these people talking about all these things that we can do, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to be very active, and we're going to change the world. And then you're stuck in this menial job, pushing paper every day. You're like, this isn't what I hoped for. This, this isn't exactly what I hoped for. Or... Maybe, maybe, once again, you wanted to celebrate your anniversary with your wife, and now instead of celebrating your anniversary, you're fighting over who gets the sofa, who gets the doll. Some of you, maybe, as you get in that phase of life where you're ready to enjoy things, you've lost hope because you don't have a parent that has Alzheimer's, but you're at that phase of life now, and you realize, I've just been diagnosed with cancer. This isn't what I hoped for. I'm always in pain. I'm always hurting. And I wanted to enjoy this phase of life. It's not what I hoped for. Now these guys are walking with Christ. They can't even see. That's, that's kind of where we're at sometimes. When we realize it's not what we hoped for, we don't even look at Christ at that point. We're so hurt. We're so devastated. We can't see. So the next verse says, In addition, some of our women amazed us. On a side note here on this one, I just want to say that last week, last Sunday when we were serving, in addition, some of our women amazed us. Man, they were like, get off of that weed eater, let me have it. I mean, I had, these women, y'all are awesome. Ladies, y'all rock. Out there raking up, making us guys look crazy as we're standing around a fire going, hey, that's a big fire. Yep. <laughs> Take a little more in it, that's a big fire. Ladies over here sweating, sweating, weed eaters and machetes. Some of our women amazed us. Anyways, they went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. See, when they went to the tomb, they didn't see him. Just like these two guys, they couldn't see him. They couldn't see him. And the difference is, was no longer in the tomb, he got out of the tomb. He is with these two guys, and they don't see him. And you know, God is really like that at times. We can't, we can't see him in the present. We can't see him right now. We don't, we don't know where he's at because we're hurting, you know? We, we don't always see where he's at right now. But as we look back, we can begin to see that he was, he was with me. My hurt. He was with me in my despair. You know, we can't we can't always see him right now. But looking back, the picture can always become clearer. Um, next, what happens? I'm, I'm not going to read the scripture. You can read it on your own because we're, we're short on time. But next, what happens is he's walking down. He, 
walk with them to Emmaus.